I have The Oxcart Man by Donald Hall. Donald Hall is a, I'm a, love his poetry, I love his essays, I have a whole shelf on the other side of his work, and the language is so simple and so clear that um, I like to, you know, I'll read this every couple of pages when I'm doing my own work and say, do I have some extraneous words that can come out? And uh, I'll rip them out. <laughs> Just one more book, please, uh... Okay. I'm always interested in watching the artists work for my books um, and see how they work. Who works from photographs, who works uh, from other designs. And along the top are where I keep my working papers for the books that were published. And uh, so I remember the process when I get frustrated. I can look and see that um, Tuttle's Red Barn took me that much paper to get through and probably about two years of work. Uh, I can, you know, see uh, the process sometimes. It reminds me th um, that I have to keep plowing through. November 15th, 2008. Jennifer Michelson prepared an amazing dinner and was particularly nice to sit down for a few minutes after a day of running from place to place. After dinner, Richard took me down to his office, showed me all the work he's put into his books, including Tuttle's Red Barn and As Good as Anybody. He also told me some incredible stories and shared some of the lessons he's learned as a children's book author. I'm Mark Blevis. On this edition of Just One More Book, Rock Stars of Reading Part 14, Richard Michelson. Here's my book, Tuttle's Red Barn. I think we were talking about that a little bit. And for those writers out there who are wondering what goes into a 32-page picture book, that's all the work. Uh, all the pages, all the drafts um, starts very early on from the idea. Let's see what I've got here. If I have... I should have organized this before you came. I knew you were coming, no, but I good. didn't. This, this is um, the, the, mind, the, the insight into the creative mind. So the reason that I work with Mary and I don't illustrate myself is um, originally I was this Tuttle's Red Bawn, um, which I'm pleased was a Publishers Weekly Best Book of 2007, um, was very unusual for me because uh, most of my work is based in the inner city, it's um, based on racial issues, or it's poetry. So when uh, my agent called me up and asked if I wanted to do a book, Tuttle's Red Barn, about the oldest family farm in America, uh, a true story about one farm in one family that um, from the 1600s till today is still the same piece of land farmed by the same family, uh, my first reaction was, this book's not for me. Uh, I've never been on a farm in my life, and uh, I know nothing about farming. And uh, I turned it down, and all night I was sleeping, and I said to myself, are you crazy? You just turned down a book with Mary Azarian, uh, one of the great woodcut artists uh, working today, uh, called the cut artist for Snowflake Bentley. So I called my agent back and uh, said, well, maybe I'll reconsider. And uh, his response was not to think of it as a farming book, but to think of it as a book about passing down knowledge from generation to generation. And he said, and that's something you do, Rich. Uh, all your books, you know, you have a grandfather talking to the grandson. And, you know, if you think of it like that, it's exactly what you do. Originally, I was going to do poetry. It's uh, because I had a cover from 1600 to 2000, 400 years and 32 pages. That doesn't give me a lot of room. So I wanted to do a little poem about each generation. So I, um, the first thing I did was I divided it up. And if you can zero in here, you can see my great illustrations. That's my little stick figures, um, figuring out the generations. And my idea originally was to have, like Snowflake 
Bentley, which Mary did, a sidebar where she had facts, I was going to have a little bottom of the page where we were going to see each generation and did my first mock-up to get a sense of what fits on each page when I was doing it and talked about from one generation to the next generation. I then sent it to my editor who said, very nice book, Rich, but there's nothing in here about farming. It's all about generations and people, but it's supposed to be about farm. So I went back and I did another draft and uh, I sent it to Mary who wrote uh, all over it, I think with some comments about what I got wrong about farming uh, I, uh, and what I got wrong about animals. That then went again to my editor who marked up another manuscript on every page telling me what he liked, what he didn't like, uh, what he thought I should change. Uh, when we finally got to a manuscript we were somewhat happy with, because this is a truth uh, story, I sent it to the Tuttle family to make sure that I had done them justice and got their history right. At that point I found out that um, because there are uh, like four or five John Tuttles in every generation and Elijah Tuttles, etc., that I had followed the wrong family tree about the eighth generation. And uh, I followed the wrong John Tuttle. And uh, so I had to go back to my research and change it to bring it up to the current day. So it went, this, this book over two years went through probably about 10, 12 drafts. And, uh, and then finally I got some little sketches from Mary where she laid it out. At that point, I reworked it again because once I saw how she had envisioned it, I realized that there was too much text on some pages, too little on others. I'm fortunate, while you're filming this, this year, um, it's actually been a very difficult year for me because I have three new books out this year and I've been complaining about it to everyone um, because it's hard for me to focus on one or the other when um, uh, out on the road and it's like having three children and wanting to give them all your attention and you're scattered. Uh, and then I realized how foolish it sounds to be complaining about having three books out in one year. Like, you know, um, that would have been my dream ages ago. Uh, um, but it's purely happenstance. One book was a year late. Uh, one book was a little bit early. One book was scheduled on time. But uh, this is uh, the paperwork that went into my book As Good As Anybody with the absolutely fantastic Raul Cologne. Uh, who I hadn't known. As Good As Anybody is as a nonfiction book. It's about Martin Luther King Jr. and Abraham Joshua Heschel's amazing march towards freedom. And this is a book about uh, the Selma March. I'm absolutely thrilled with this book. It's been doing wonderful. Uh, Booklist just uh, listed it as one of the 10 best biographies of the year and one of the 10 best religious books of the year. Um, it uh, has been getting a lot of energy for me. Um, it's about uh, the march to Selma when Martin Luther King was originally stopped by uh, politicians and policemen and dogs um, when they were trying uh, to march for voting rights. Uh, it's a book that during this season of thankfully Obama's victory, um, I'm happy to say that, uh, that Obama uh, has uh, read this book and uh, that's a important period for him historically. And when um, Martin Luther King was turned back on the original voting rights march, uh, he put out a call for help. And the first person who answered that call was the great Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. And uh, arm in arm, this is based on a very photo famous photograph of the two of them. Uh, they, against much opposition even among his own uh, fellow uh, uh, Jews and rabbis. 
uh, Abraham flew down south and joined hands with Martin and the two of them started a march together and by the time they arrived uh, let's see this, this, this is just uh, absolutely incredible uh, there were 25,000 people as they marched through the street joined their march as it was going started with 600 people and they did finally make a difference and make that change and uh, you know what I'm trying here is to show how how individual people can make a difference they can change things so I'm, I'm just absolutely thrilled with this book and um, and I had emailed my editor and suggested that I had seen another book that I liked very much uh, that I thought the illustrator would be perfect a band of angels a story inspired by the Jubilee Singers. And I emailed her that morning saying, would you consider this illustrator? She gave me a call later, uh, independently, and said, um, what do you think about Raul Colon doing the book? And I couldn't place the name. I knew the books, but I couldn't place the name. Um, and I said, well, before you hire him, could you just check your email because there's an illustrator I'd love who did a band of angels and that's one of those incredible coincidences we had both um, that's when I found out that Raul had in fact been the illustrator of this book we both came to his name independently I didn't know him had never met him and uh, Michelle my editor called me a couple of weeks later and said Raul would love to do the book so I was just absolutely thrilled. It was one of the great uh, coincidences. It, this book was based on my childhood. I grew up in East New York, Brooklyn. And originally, it's about, as you know, a little Jewish boy and a little black boy who live across the alley from each other. And they're not allowed to play during the day, but they become best friends at night through their bedroom windows. And E.B. originally asked me for my home address, my old apartment building, before he did this uh, book. Um, because he wanted to go and perhaps set the scenes there. Uh, East New York is one of the very few places in Brooklyn that still has not been drenchified. And E.B. called me up afterwards and said he was setting the book elsewhere, I believe in the Bronx. And I said, why? He said, well, I went to that old neighborhood and I'm not taking out my fancy camera there. My very first book children's book, I should say, was done with Leonard Baskin. It was called Did You Say Ghosts? I absolutely loved it. This book went out of print, and uh, Leonard passed away about 10 years ago. But uh, a few years ago, Harcourt asked to republish the book. But they wanted to do it with a different illustrator. And um, at first I said, how can you do that? This is, you know, this is a piece. This is how it works. The words and the art together. This is how I envision the book. And they wanted something a little younger, a little funnier. And so they ended up hiring Adam McCauley. When they first sent me his work, I said, well, no, that's completely wrong. It doesn't work. And, and I fought them on it. I said, no, I, I think that he's totally wrong for the book. Um, Thankfully, I lost that battle, and Adam McCauley did, I think, an incredible job. When I saw this book and his illustrations, it just totally blew me away. And it showed me how the same words can be interpreted by two different artists and end up in two totally different books and two totally different mo moods. They both worked with the same text. In the hands of a great artist, they can take your words and create something you didn't even envision, something greater. So that now when I think of my background and where I grew up, I often think of the illustrations from across the alley that E.B. did, even though it wasn't my house. I've started to re uh, imagine my childhood differently.